It seems as if everyone likes an SUV, but in truth, not everybody wants an SUV. So if you want something that's nice, that's reasonably practical, and that won't break the bank, where are you gonna park your hard-earned money? Chasing cars, honest reviews of your next car. Brought to you by Budget Direct. The no-brainer answer is in the small hatchback segment, and the two strong bets are in trusted nameplates of Toyota Corolla and Mazda 3. Both have long-reaching provenances and well-proven track records. And both offer an array of variants and engine choices in both hatchback and sedan forms. Well, you can spend up in whichever lineup that you choose. We'll put together a pair of relative price busters to see which one is going to be the best alternative to a small SUV. To my right is the Toyota Corolla FX Hybrid Hatch, which starts from just over $38,000 on the road. And to my left is the Mazda 3 G20e Evolve, which also clocks in at around 38 grand in this form that you see here. Neither of these are base models, and both of them bring the word hybrid branding to their powertrains. But when it comes to motivation, they're very different from one another under the bonnet, but more of that later. In short, we're going to size up how practical they are, how nice they are to drive, and how they stack up in terms of value. But before we suss out any of that, first, let's check out styling. It's highly subjective, of course, but for my money, the Mazda is certainly the better looker of the two. With its swoopy lines, its 18-inch wheels, and its sole red paintwork, which adds $695 to the bottom line, the G20e Evolve certainly has a sportier and more upmarket look. It sits above the pure variant in the range, and despite that version having 16-inch wheels, it still looks pretty fetching. But that's not to say that the Corolla is exactly an eyesore. Toyota has done a great job with the design of this generation, and given it's 12 generations in, the carmaker has certainly had plenty of practice. Like its Mazda Nemesis, this SX version sits one up from base, which is the Ascent Sport, although both of these sit on 16-inch wheels that really don't do its styling much justice. Still, in its rich sunstone orange paintwork, which does add $580 to the bottom line, it's certainly a looker. However, from the kickoff, it's a slight advantage to the Mazda. Outside, both offer LED lighting front and rear with auto high beam, as well as power folding mirrors and rain-sensing wipers. Further, both competitors fit both front and rear parking sensors to complement reversing cameras, though the Mazda does get a 360-degree view monitor. Exterior features-wise, they're both pretty close, so let's check out the interiors, starting off with the Corolla. For all of its orangey exterior richness, the Corolla cabin is almost colourless, and so it's very drab by comparison. But what it lacks in colour, it makes up for with an interesting design that is actually quite functional. The wheel is nice and tactile, and these seats are actually very form-fitting and comfortable, even though the trim is actually just a bit hardy. But you do get nice fabric touch points on the centre console and the armrest, and this dash fascia is also soft, so it is quite pleasing. There is, though, a lot of hard plastics, particularly on the lower door trims and along the centre console. And you do get little splashes of piano black and sort of satin silver, but it is a bit unadventurous. Still, all the controls fall nicely to hand, and ergonomically, it's very sound. Particularly the HVAC controls, so the dual zone climate controls just fall easily to hand, and they're very easy to adjust. You do get a 7-inch digital driver's screen that does actually bring a bit of colour to the cabin, and it is quite clear and crisp. There's also a new 8-inch touchscreen infotainment system that we first saw in Corolla Cross, but at 8 inches, the screen is actually fairly small. On the plus side, it pairs with your phone quite quickly. It does have proprietary sat-nav. The reversing camera is pretty decent, and Apple CarPlay is wireless. Also nice for a grey this low in the range, you also get an inductive charge point, a single USB-C under the dash, and another USB-C with a 12-volt in the centre console bin. You get two cup holders here, and storage is pretty decent, so let's check out the rear. Climb into the back, and certainly from my perspective, it is darker and a lot gloomier in here. And as you'd probably expect, the room in the back here probably isn't quite as generous as you might find in a small SUV, although I must say, it's not too bad. Climbing in and out is a bit of a chore in these tight door apertures, but actually once you're in here, the room is pretty decent. Unfortunately, when it comes to this SX grey, Toyota isn't that interested in rear appointments, so you don't get any air vents in the back of the rear console, and there's no device power. Still, and quite somewhat strangely, you do get four cup holders. So, two in the centre console, and one each in each door trim, for those who are particularly thirsty. Go figure. Right, so that's row two, let's check out the boot. 
The biggest shortcoming about the Corolla Cross is its boot space. It's literally half the size of the boot space in the Corolla Cross SUV. You do get a space saver spare under the floor and there's actually some extra space under there for some groceries if you so choose. Let's check out the Mazda. Like the Corolla, the Mazda 3 almost avoids any kind of colour in the cabin bar some very dark ready orange stitching and the trim on the seats. And as an overall, the Mazda's cabin design couldn't be any more different to the Corolla. The seating is a lot sportier and more low slung and right from the get-go you do notice that it looks a bit more upmarket when it comes to the look and the feel of some of the textures. So while it doesn't exactly ooze luxury, there is a sense that the Mazda is a bit more upmarket. It fits an electric driver's seat which is quite comfy and does have electric lumbar adjust. You do get this almost European style steering wheel and these neat air vents and there's a fair bit more chrome here although it is quite restrained. The centre console arrangement is quite larger and more elaborate including a very deep bin and the instruments do have a classic analogue look although the centre round Dell is digital and 7 inches though it doesn't have a digital speedo. However the digital speedo does appear in the standard head up display. The media display screen is 8.8 .8 inches so it is a little bit larger than the Corolla though it is quite small and it's not a touch screen. Instead you adjust the content via this MZD rotary controller which is a method that has sort of fallen out of vogue with many car makers these days. You do get proprietary sat nav and wide carplay although it is a little bit clumsier to access and adjust than it is in the Toyota. In terms of device connectivity you do get two USB-A ports in the centre console bin and a 12 volt outlet although there is no inductive phone charging pad. And you do get a sharp reversing camera and a 360 degree camera though it is small and quite fish eyed. Right, let's check out the rear. Like the Corolla it is a bit of a clumsy feat climbing into the second row although once you're in here it is a little bit roomier than the Toyota. However, with this high window line, it is actually more claustrophobic and darker in the rear here. And if you're a little kid, you're not really going to be able to see the world whiz by outside the window. Unlike the Toyota, there are only two cup holders. However, you do get rear air vents, which is nice, given that you hope that your rear occupants want to breathe. But despite all that, the seats are actually quite comfy and it wouldn't be such a bad place to spend for a long trip. Right, let's check out the boot. The boot floor of the Mazda sits a lot lower than that of the Toyota and at 295 litres it's clearly a much larger luggage space. There is a huge lip to secure your luggage although you do have to inevitably lift objects from out of the rear. It is though nicely carpeted and like the Toyota you do get a space saver spare under the floor. Verdict? Well the Mazda is more practical for space and it is a little bit fancier for those who care about that sort of stuff. Right, let's take it for a drive and let's start with the Mazda. Up to this point of the test, both of these hatchbacks have been, on balance, very similar. But right here is where a lot of those similarities end. That's because when it comes to power units, each is quite distinctly different. The Toyota, for its part in this twin test, is called a hybrid. That's because it is a hybrid. Sometimes internal combustion drives a car, and sometimes electricity drives a car, and oftentimes both drive the car. This Mazda, however, is what some people call a mild hybrid, which is an insidious buzzword that's crept its way into the motoring vernacular. And if you're hoping that the Mazda ever kicks into electric propulsion, be it wholly or even partially, you'd be wrong. M-Hybrid, as it's called, is essentially a rolling stop-start system, and it's paired to a 2-litre naturally aspirated engine. M-Hybrid drops fuel consumption from 6.2 litres to 6 litres per 100 compared to the regular Mazda 3, which is powered by, guess what, a naturally aspirated 2-litre four-cylinder engine. Well, that's a bummer. Worse still, in real-world testing, the combined consumption for this particular M-Hybrid Mazda 3 nudges close to 8 litres per 100. Yikes! It does offer 114 kilowatts and 200 newton metres of, yes, wholly 100% internal combustion petrol power. And it does run on 91 RON fuel. It's backed by a 6-speed automatic and as you'd expect it powers the front wheels. The engine note is quite buzzy like a jar full of wasps but the engine itself is actually quite smooth and it's very responsive to throttle input. But get it into the mid-range and there's not a lot of real serious shove. One of the highlights of the Mazda 3 on-road experience is its chassis. Dynamically it's quite crisp and responsive and it's pretty light on its rubber feet. The steering too is nice and direct but it is a little bit heavy for a car that's not really terribly sporty. 
but is very stable and responsive to driver input and it can be a bit of fun on a country road. However, that underpinning sporty character does mean that the suspension is set reasonably firm. At lower speed and across lumps, the ride can get a little bit jiggly and hit a sharp speed hump and the ride can get pretty jarring. Overall though, on road, the Mazda is quite composed and well polished. And the small hatchback really does bring a lot of engagement that you really don't get from most small SUVs. Right, let's check out the Toyota. The Corolla SX Hybrid is, well, a real hybrid, and one with a powertrain that was upgraded in late 2022. Power has now climbed into triple figures and the hybrid system now offers 103 kilowatts and 142 newton meters of total power and total torque output. Now on paper, those figures are well down on what that Mazda 3 boasts. Although what Toyota's a little coy about is exactly how much torque the electric motor adds to propulsion. It's backed by a CVT transmission rather than the conventional automatic fitted in the Mazda and of course it powers the front wheels. So let's start with one of the biggest differences between the Toyota and the Mazda powertrains and that's fuel consumption. Toyota claims a 4 litres per 100 for the combined fuel consumption claim and that's half of what we got out of the Mazda. But in the real world the story even gets rosier for the Toyota because We've just taken out on a combined road loop and it's returned a figure of just 3.8 litres per hundred, which is kind of remarkable. So how could it be that much more fuel economical than the Mazda? Well, the Toyota's hybrid system, as a good Aussie owners would know, tends to favour fuel economy in the urban cycle. And around town, the Toyota's hybrid system will automatically kick into silent EV mode when it so chooses, and it does so in this new version quite often. Like the older hybrid designs, it still sort of nips in and out between silent electric mode and fairly raucous internal combustion, although it is a little bit smoother and more refined in the transition than previous versions. This new hybrid system does hang on to electric mode a little more often than it did with the old powertrains, but when you're out on the open road, it does tend to labour in the internal combustion and it is a little bit thirstier than it is around town. However, you combine those two together and you do end up in the grand scheme of things with very impressive fuel economy figures. As for the rest of the package, the Toyota doesn't really have that sort of sporting character of the Mazda, but it's not to a fault. The steering is lighter, which isn't a bad thing, and the suspension is set a little bit softer, which does improve the ride quality. And some of that ride quality advantage is down to those larger balloon style 16 inch tires doesn't quite have the sporting edge of the Mazda 3, but the chassis is fantastic and it still is very engaging. The suspension is set a little softer too, so it does ride both smaller and larger bumps a lot better. All up, it is a very natural and refined thing to drive, and it's actually quite rewarding. And in terms of on-road character, it's probably a little bit closer to its SUV stablemates, including the rather excellent Corolla Cross that shares the same platform. Performance really isn't a high priority when you're money conscious in small hatchback land. Though response and the ability for a car to get out of a side street still is important as a measure of safety. So we've performance tested both of these hatchbacks and their times are up on the screen right now. But really, it's fuel economy and running costs that's of utmost importance to buyers to these kind of cars. So when it comes to ownership, that's where we're going to go next. Ownership-wise, both hatches come with five-year unlimited kilometre warranty. In the case of the Corolla, Toyota offers 10 years of conditional warranty on the high-voltage battery. The Corolla servicing is capped at $245 per visit for a total of $1,225 over five years. The Mazda, though, costs between $328 and $374 per visit. Across five years, that amounts to $1,732, which is quite a bit more expensive. Both run on cheap 91 Ron fuel, however, because the Mazda is twice expensive, it's going to double the cost in fuel. So when it comes to ongoing running costs, it's definitely advantage Toyota. In verdict, each competitor ran the other quite close, so determining which is the best small hatch for you really does come down to personal preference. However, that's not a real verdict, so let's not sit on the fence. There are many reasons to endorse the Mazda for the win, given its upmarket vibe and its slightly larger interior space and bigger boot. That it's more expensive to run will be a fair trade for many potential buyers and eventual owners. But the big disappointment with the Mazda is the so-called hybrid system, 
with no electric drive whatsoever and it really doesn't bring anything meaningful to the Mazda 3 party. The extra 200 mils of fuel it claims to save over 100 kilometers an hour isn't really much of a dividend for the premium it asks over the regular petrol Mazda 3. And the fact that in the real world it came nowhere near its claim is really an own goal for Mazda. The Toyota appeals because its hybrid claim is genuine and it delivers in the real world with its fantastic fuel consumption. And while it's not quite as sporty as the Mazda 3, this isn't really a sports competition and it is a cracking drive and a very impressive all-rounder. Yes, it's got a small boot and yes, it's not quite as upmarket as the Mazda, but neither of those are disadvantages enough to take the win away from the impressive Toyota. That said, you can do much worse than choosing either of these hatchbacks in these variants at this price point. So that's what I think, but how about you? Put your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and as always, thanks for watching. Chasing cars.